So we're going to be talking about Blake, Wordsworth, and Coleridge, romantic poets in the age of industry and revolution. And I'm going to keep my lecture, hopefully, somewhat brief this week because I am asking you to watch, uh, I think, a very good BBC video on these three poets, and it sets them in the context of the, the particular age in which they were working and living. Um, so let's get going. So first, um, this, this poetry that we're talking about um, comes from what we call the Romantic Revival period from 1770 to 1830. But I want to right away question this term revival because it's far too gentle for what took place, place in this period. Um, and I think we could uh, easily call it the Romantic Revolution. Um, and in fact, this period encompasses the period that historians call the Age of Revolution, 1796 to 1798. And for example, if you wanted some evidence of that, look at the modern film adapta adaptation of Les Miserables, which in fact is echoing Blake's poetry in some cases, people argue. But you'll be reminded how the spirit of liberty and revolution is, is still very much in the air into the 1800s for most European citizens. Um, and revolution, again, if we want to think of it as a romantic revolution, has certain conditions, or that certain conditions are required for a revolution to exist. Um, one would be intolerable oppression, um, which leads to a populist movement from below to attempt to change the balance of power. Um, and that attempt to change is for the sake of a vision of an idealized future. But you still might want to argue whether or not the Romantic movement emerged from such conditions. But I think so, so let me try to make that point. First, um, if we think about uh, the Romantics working in the context of revolutionary Europe, um, they turn with zeal and energy to the following. They shake off the oppressive restrictions of the Augustan writers of the Enlightenment. Um, and what you saw, uh, Swift and Afra Ben, are not perhaps the best examples of the, those oppressive restrictions. Um, but nonetheless, they had come to value the heroic couplet and uh, balance and reason above all else. Um, they're also in, working in the context of the social upheaval of industrialization, which is oppressive. Um, and writers embrace the populist roots of literature and dialect. Um, so the populist uprising, maybe not, but certainly a, a deep valuing of the populace. And they return to nature as the source of inspiration and renewal that would lead to an idealized future. And they very much individually and collectively believed in an idealized future, individually in that they each had perhaps their own vision of that future. So there's just some key concepts. And I, I put a pamphlet online that I, I'm asking you to read a handout about the concepts of romanticism. But let me just touch on a few that you will see, many of which you'll see in Blake, Wordsworth, and Coleridge. An interest in primitivism, a love of nature, an interest in the past, especially the medieval. And you probably won't see that in any of these poets, but it's part of romanticism. Elements of mysticism, celebration of individualism, and a re reaction against whatever characterized neoclassicism, again, the Enlightenment poets who were so strict about their heroic couplet and reason and balance. Among the specific characteristics embraced by Romantic poets, here are a few important points. They abandoned that uh, Augustan heroic couplet in favor of blank verse, the sonnet, and many other experimental verse forms, including the Spenserian stanza. Um, they dropped uh, the conventional poetic diction in favor of fresher language and bolder figures. We see this very much in lyrical ballads by Coleridge and Wordsworth. They idealized rural life. Um, they had an extreme enthusiasm for wild, irregular, or gr grotesque in both nature and art. And you'll see that very much if you choose to look at William Blake's um, paintings. Um, they valued unrestrained imagination, um, enthusiasm for the uncivilized or the natural, again, that sort of populist, that, that basic, and then ultimately a uh, collection of, and, and imitation of popular ballads, again, returning to the songs of the people. So let me say something 
really, I'm just going to put two slides here on William Blake. So it's going to be very important that you watch the film and uh, take a look at Blake's poetry elsewhere in the, in the book um, and perhaps uh, some of the examples I pointed out online. Blake was a nonconformist both politically and poetically. Um, for example, he knew and respected Mary Wollstonecraft, Thomas Paine, and others, he, particularly for their defense of human liberty. Um, as an artist, he valued the imagination over reason, and he believed that poems and actually personal ideals should be constructed not from observations of nature, but from inner visions. So again, I mentioned his artwork. Take a look at his artwork online. Just Google it. You'll see this sort of fantastical uh, world that is Blake's inner vision, and people love him for it, though many in his time didn't understand him. He developed a complex mytho-religion. I say mytho-religion because it's, you know, it's, it's, in some ways it's mythography or mythology. In other ways, it's, it's his own religion. And it reflected a dualism between good and evil and the possibility for individual redemption through forgiveness and personal sacrifice. And you can, if you think about these ideas, as you read the poems, you'll see this dualism between good and evil, the possibility for redemption. But he all through his life remained adamant the traditional re religion was tyrannical and exploitive of humankind. And that's very important to know about him. Um, one tip that I direct you to for um, reading Blake is uh, uh, the link there for the Poetry Foundation website. It, they do some good uh, close reading of the poems that you'll be reading and others, and I think it might give you a good taste for uh, reading Blake. And if you're more interested, of course, um, the Norton has many more poems of his included in the, in the book. Okay, Wordsworth and Coleridge I include together. That's not entirely fair by any means, but I do so because we're going to really only read from uh, the lyrical ballads. And the lyrical ballads was a combined effort. Um, there's a site called the Victorian Web. It's a very good site if you want to take a look at it. I've got the link below. But uh, their comment is, is one I want to note. Um, they say, these two poets use a technique that departs completely from the neoclassical tradition. Again, there's that rejecting uh, tyranny, where the emphasis was placed on order and balanced and reasoned thought, even in form, and that, and that is to say in poetic form. Um, Wordsworth and Coleridge take the liberty to write in blank verse, often without punctuation between lines, underlining the romantic ideal of emotion. And the reason I, I include this for your consideration is that it's emphasizing in poetic technique, these authors are revolutionary. So I'm trying to make this sort of through line for all of you that these poets are revolutionaries as much as they are simply reviving a romantic ideal. Uh, they had some key values that they shared. Um, one is that nature was central to both of their work. They both felt it was an absolute, absolute ideal and um, uh, a sort of comfort and a solace. Both valued the common folk, and that's somewhat of a disparaging term. I don't mean it that way. But, for example, they chose the title Lyrical Ballads precisely because ballads are songs of the people. And they then wanted to keep the language of people um, alive in poetry, so that while each used poetic language and technique to great effect, they're really great poets, you find them struggling to make it very uh, accessible. Um, and then Coleridge was more fascinated with the mystical and the unrestrained imagination, and you'll certainly see that in reading The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Um, and by the way, I put up a link to a um, audiobook of The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. If it's helpful to you to listen to that as you read along or to simply listen to that, I encourage you to do so because sometimes um, it, it works better if you hear it. Okay, so we're going to move on then to the other materials I've asked you to look at uh, this week and then to our discussion on the discussion board. I look forward to seeing what you have to say about these important romantic poets. <laughs>